So how does one begin to tackle this? Because the natural history of anorexia nervosa, which I began by unfolding, is sinister. It's often regarded as a trivial condition by people who don't encounter it very often, but actually it's sinister. Uh, if you take a hundred people who've developed anorexia nervosa in their teens, and you follow them for 20 years, 20% 20 of them will normally be dead from their anorexia nervosa. Of the other 80%, 40% will be recovered, and we may have a moment to discuss what recovery <laughs> means, and the other 40% will be chronically ill. And the disability will be profound. There will be a total stifling of social development. I mean, the individual may, despite anorexia nervosa, be very successful professionally. They might have a first-class honours degree in something or other. Although, ultimately, the anorexia nervosa will begin to erode even that competence. But they will be totally socially isolated. And as their parents age and die, then that is the time when they might kill themselves. So, can anything be done? And if it can, it almost certainly does need to be done as soon as possible, before the developmental gap becomes too great to bridge. So how do we try to tackle that? And I suppose that's one of the things that you've invited me along tonight to try and share with you. First of all, you've got to make a diagnosis, and I would make a diagnosis at three levels in anorexia nervosa. Now, the first level is the symptomatology, and I haven't lingered on that because I assume you're familiar with it. The individual will be emaciated, they'll be amenorrheic, they'll be restless, hyperactive, they'll have lanugo hair because that's a characterization of starvation and so on. They will have the stigmata of starvation. That will include a total, and in the anorectic's case, ironic preoccupation with food because if you're starving you start thinking of food that's the whole secret that's why sexuality gets excluded very early on it's expendable temporarily so the starving person thinks of nothing but food you may have noticed this if you miss lunch so the, the symptoms of starvation are the bi biology of starvation. The, the symptoms of anorexia nervosa at a superficial level comprise the biology of starvation these things I'm talking about, coupled with a battery of defences against ingestion. Because the irony for the anorectic is that she can't stop thinking about food and she's in the presence of plenty. She's got to resist eating it. So the battery of defences against eating has to be absolute. And that will include ritual and social avoidance of any circumstance that's likely to destabilize her capacity to curb her intake and then intense manipulation she has to totally control and manipulate her environment so she gets construed as hysterical and has tantrums she needs desperately to control the situation and if she can't resist the impulse to eat and begins to binge then she has to fall back on vomiting and of course, if she falls back on vomiting and purging, you'll know about. I mean, I have anorectics who, I've had an anorectic recently who was consuming 400 Senecot a day. And you've almost certainly got anorectics consuming huge quantities of purgatives that you don't know about. Because, I mean, it's quite common. <laughs> and so you can imagine under those circumstances, you get metabolic derangement, which is profound and quite different from calorie restraint. But I haven't got time to go into that. So the first level of diagnosis, it's a sadly demeaning condition, anorexia nervosa. Those with it often wish to demonstrate it as nobly defiant and fulfilling, but it's totally unfulfilling, I would suggest to you. It's a phobic avoidance position with your back to the wall, but it's the only position you can sustain and exist, and so you will defend it in the absence of anything better. And the second level of diagnosis is the phobic avoidance response one needs to be able to identify that fear of being more than seven stones and of avoiding weights above seven stones. And the third level of diagnosis is the identification of that maturational conflict. Now, if you want to enable your anorectic individual to become a patient, you remember, then in my experience, you will never achieve it unless you have 
identified at least the outline of that maturational problem and shared it with them and their family in such a way as to enable the whole family system to see that there may be a possibility of coping differently. And that will be the task if you're actually going to engage your anorectic patient in considering the possibility of change. We will need to spend about three hours in that initial assessment and in that time we will need to enable the parents, who are often lovely people, to construe themselves as patients as well. And they will not come along often with any comprehension of the nature of the problem because the human mind enables that. You have to break through that wall of denial. And having engaged them in that way, if you're going to fundamentally help them, you're going to have to help them solve the problem that you've identified. But of course, so long as they're low in weight, it doesn't exist. And so, there are various ways of trying to help people with anorexia nervosa, and one of them is an inpatient package, and uh, I and my team have described that endlessly, and I'll come back to it in a moment. And another, of course, is to try and help them in outpatients. And another is to try to empower them to begin to help themselves. And because of the plethora of cases, we've recently written a self-help book, which can go some way, I think, towards enabling people to do this. What I would mean by self-help is not that the individual is trying to do something outside of the context of professional help, but that actually they've made that decision that there's something wrong with them and that they'd like help for it. That is self-help. That is the biggest self-help step that an anorectic can take. And then they can say, please help me. Well, they won't say it quite like that, often. But they might begin to say it. And the inpatient package, if we take anorectics in, and we usually take them in if they're very seriously ill, like, you know, say 30 kilograms or less, or sometimes a bit more, then we will set a contract with them and we will say, look, if you come in here, we'd say to Lucy, look, Lucy, here you are at 16. Now, you fell off the developmental rails when you were 14. And ever since then, you've been about eight. Now, if you come into hospital, there's no way that you can cope. Let's say Lucy was 19 and she'd had it since she was 14. There's no way that Lucy can cope with being a 19-year-old. She couldn't cope with being a 14-year-old. And ever since she's been 14, she's been nine. Okay? So we say to Lucy, look, we're going to help you in the first instance get back to being 14. I'm talking about emotionally. You know, you've got four A levels and all of that. But actually in terms of your personal development, that's where you should be. So the average weight of someone of your height, age 14, is this. And that's your target weight. It's not in your mind, it's not in my mind, it's the average weight in the population. And that's the weight we're going to aim at if, you, if you're going to come in and we're going to try and help you. And you'll come in, and in fact we shall require such an anorectic to go to bed and to eat 3,000 calories a day until they get to that weight. Now, there's no way an anorectic is going to do that, of course, if you just see them and say, look, you know, you need to get to uh, 52 kilograms and eat 3,000 calories a day. They know how to gain weight they're in business avoiding it, unless they believe you're going to crack that developmental problem. And so coupled with that behavioral constraint on gaining weight, which will reactivate it, remember, and you can see such an anorectic going through puberty, they'll get spots again, they'll start blushing, they'll be, boys will become aware of them, all of that is grist to the psychotherapeutic mill. They will be engaged in intensive individual and family psychotherapy. And that needs to be skilled. And they'll be involved in a whole variety of activities. We involve our anorectics in projective art, which is a form of communication, and I think you'll be hearing about that. We involve them in psychodrama, communication skills training, assertive training. But in particular, the individual and family psychotherapy we've demonstrated beyond doubt is the key pivotal intervention. If you're treating them in outpatients, we would adopt the same view about weight gain, but of course we wouldn't be so uh, controlling day by day to ensure that they were able to eat. But we would still set them the same target 
And within that context, and we have a, com we have a multidisciplinary team with dietitians and so on, the dietitian would, would be titrating the rate of weight gain against that same outpatient psychotherapeutic approach. So that's the kind of treatment that we uh, adopt, and it's a package that I've been practicing with anorexia nervosa for about 30 years. Here's an anorectic for you, just to remind you of what someone who's severely ill with anorexia nervosa looks like. Not just a slim person, do you see? There's a Belson-like quality to it, which is very disturbing. And after all these years, what we believe <coughs> we can achieve are what I would say are the profit margins of medicine. We can alter the natural history of this condition significantly often, but we can't always do that. Thank you very much.